doing a series on spiritual growth. And as I was thinking about our, our topic for today, which is basically, you know, how do I grow in my faith? I was thinking about uh, a little morning routine um, that I have with my son. See, a lot of times what I like to do is I like to wake up, go work out, and then come home, and I like to make eggs, like every morning. I'll make eggs, and this is going to sound disgusting, but it's amazing. Eggs, spinach, a little bit of goat cheese, and the crown jewel, hot sauce. It's magical, and I'm told it's healthy. It's like eating a salad for breakfast. Well, Sammy in our house, he's our middle son, he's two, He's usually the one that wakes up the earliest, and so he's usually downstairs right about that time I'm cooking breakfast, and he is at this stage in life where he wants to do everything I do. He always wants to help, whether it's making his oatmeal or recently making the eggs. So he'll pull his little chair, he'll go in the dining room, grab a chair, pull it all the way into the counter, put it right up by the counter, stand up there, and he's just tall enough to like reach things he shouldn't reach, and then he gets ready to help. Now... I don't know why, maybe I was in a fog that morning, I forgot that he was standing there right at the counter, and I set the entire thing of eggs right there. And Sammy, trying to be helpful, decides, I'm going to open the egg carton for Dad. And I hear one egg fall to the ground. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Okay, it's okay, he just wants to, it's a good job, Sammy, you opened it up. Don't do anything else yet. <laughs> so I'm cleaning that egg up. Just about have it done getting ready to start making the eggs when I hear crack. He grabs the egg, slams it on the counter, just like he sees Dad do in the pan, and then egg number two falls to the ground. Now at this point, I love Jesus, but sometimes when I'm not as awake, not as much as I should, and I'm, I'm, I'm losing my patience in that moment, right? And I'm looking down, and all I do is I see him, and the next words I hear out of his mouth are, I'm big, just like Dad. And I'm like, ah, I can't get mad at you now, even though I'm cleaning up eggs. Because I realize in that moment, the only reason he wants to make eggs with that big like Dad, he wants to grow up. And what you realize is growing up is a messy process. We're going to break a lot more eggs down the road. But in the midst of that messy process, he's going to grow into a man who one morning wakes up and makes dad his breakfast while he's sitting on the porch, drinking a cup of coffee going, it was worth it. <laughs> All those eggs I cleaned up. And I was thinking about that as we stepped into this series, those words, I'm big. Because when we step into church, that's really why we come here. Just like Sammy, we want to grow up. We want to grow in our faith, and we want to grow in our understanding of God. That's why we wake up early on a Sunday morning and we come out to this place, because our hope is that our faith will be stronger when we leave than when we came in. But how is it we do that? How do we grow in our faith, or in the words of Sammy, how do we get big in our faith? And so what I wanted to do is just take these next two weeks, before we step into the fall, before we jump back into full routine with school and work, and all of a sudden summer hours are over, so we have to work on Friday again, and before we jump into all that stuff, I want us to take a moment to step back and say, how can we grow in our faith? How does God tell us how we do that in the Bible? And then what are some of our opportunities to do that right here at Bethlehem? Because the amazing thing is, a really big church, Willow Creek, out in Chicago, one of the biggest churches in America, it's been around since the 70s, and it's just steadily grown, and it's always been really good at connecting people to Jesus. And, and about five or so years ago, well, actually almost 10 years ago now, they did a study. They said, how are we doing at helping people grow in their faith, and what do they expect when they walk through these doors? And the results they found shocked them. But at the same time, it was an opportunity for encouragement. And they were answering three questions. And three questions they were answering is this. What do people expect when they come to church? What do people want when they come to church? And what do people need when they come to church? 
to be able to grow in their relationship with Jesus. Now, you may say, well, those first two questions sound the same. They're totally different. Expectation. When I go to the doctor, I expect to get a shot. It does not mean I want to get a shot at the doctor. When I go to the doctor, I expect him to check my cholesterol and my heart rate and all that stuff. It doesn't mean I want him to do those things, right? There's a difference between expectation and desire. When you go to the doctor, you desire that they're going to not give you a shot, right? But they could, and so it doesn't surprise you when that happens. Do you know what people expect? The number one thing people expect when they come to church? Spiritual direction. Guidance on how they can grow closer to God. But you know what's kind of crazy? You know the number of things people think people want when they come to church? Spiritual direction. They want to know how they can grow closer to God. And here's the crazy thing. Do you know the number one thing people need in order to grow in their faith? Spiritual direction. So when you come to church, you're sitting here in the perfect place to begin to learn how to grow in your faith. Because this is the place where you can come and find the guidance you need to be able to learn to connect with God and to connect with God in such a way that you actually grow in your relationship with Him. So that's why we're spending the next two weeks looking at this. And we're going to do two things over the next two weeks. We're going to look at what God says in Scripture about growing in your faith. And then we're going to look at number two, how you can do that right here at Bethlehem. So the very first thing when you look at growing in your faith is this crazy verse that we just heard in the book of 1 Corinthians. In the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking to this church in Corinth. And he says this important thing that really keys in on how we grow in our faith. Paul says this. He says, For I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. See, what Paul was talking about in Corinth was at this time in Corinth, they had a problem with a cult of personality. People were always engaged with who's the top personality, what are you here to your here. We can't relate to that today, can we? We don't do that with anything like sports or politics or even church denomination. We do the same thing, don't we? And they used to do that in the time of Corinth. They used to have these traveling teachers that would come in and they would, they would set up in the middle of the city and then they would start doing these discourses and these teachings and and people would wrap around that, and they would start to follow them. And then, of course, you wanted to prove why your school was better than somebody else's school. And so you would follow other people around and tell them what was wrong with your teacher, their teacher versus your teacher. In fact, sometimes it got so heated that some teacher's students would actually follow other people's classes around. And in the midst of that time, they would try to make a fool of the teacher. And some of the students of that teacher would get so angry, they would actually pull that other person out and beat them. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty crazy, I know, but we don't see that same thing in sports or politics or faith. And then Paul says this really important thing. He says, Corinthians, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. It was Paul's way of saying this. Paul and Apollos, in the grand scheme, are unimportant. They're just servants that came to do what God told them to do. Paul says, so I came here and I started this church. And then Apollos took it over. And Apollos, when you read church history, was an incredible preacher. And so everybody was like, yeah, but Apollos is a great teacher. But everybody's like, yeah, but Paul's letters are phenomenal. I think they're going to go down in history. They're so good. And Paul is saying, look, you guys are starting to cause dissension among yourselves over who's the better teacher, and you've missed the point. Paul says, all I did was plant. All Apollos did was come and water. But it was God who gave the growth. See, the one who grows you spiritually is God. I can't do anything to grow you spiritually. All I can do is be faithful to what God has told me to do. Just like when you're planting something outside. Do we have any gardeners in the house? Yeah? I'm a terrible gardener. I grow weeds well, really well like incredibly well. But when it comes to planting plants, I'm not great at it. 
Maybe it has to do with patience or not knowing the right soil type or whatever, but this is what I do know about planting. If I take that seed and I put that seed in the right soil and then I water it and I just sit there and go, grow now, it won't do anything. What I have to do is give it time. I have to give it time to do what it's going to do. And then even when it comes to that actual physical plant, it's God who gives the growth, not me. All I can do is be faithful to the tasks that will help it grow. See, when you come to church, you don't come to church because I can make you grow. You come to church because just like that little seed, you're putting yourself in an environment where you are more likely to grow. See, when you come to this place, you're guaranteed to hear a few things. Number one, you're guaranteed to hear the gospel. And in order for you to grow in your faith, you have to start by situating yourself in an environment that's going to be centered on the gospel. In fact, that's what Paul says in the book of Romans. In the book of Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in the righteous of God, He is revealed from faith for faith, as it's written, the righteous shall live by faith. So what Paul is saying is, the powerful thing in the church is the gospel. If you're teaching anything else, it may sound good. It may be some great advice. But it's not going to be life-changing unless it's saturated in the message of God's love and forgiveness for you. Which simply means, first, what God's done for us. And second, how we can live that out. And the other thing an environment needs to be centered on to really help you grow in your faith is Christ. See, if it's not centered on the gospel and on Christ, it doesn't have the power to do anything. In fact, this is what the gospel writer John said. Thomas was, was sitting there and he was talking to Jesus and Jesus was preparing them for the fact that he was going to leave. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus looks at him and he says this, I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. See, the reason an environment helps you grow in your faith in God when it's centered on the gospel and Christ is because if you don't know Jesus, you don't know God. You just know some picture of God that you've created. Because Jesus said, literally, I am God in the room. And this is a hard thing for us to grasp a lot of times. It's kind of offensive in our culture, isn't it? It's almost like you're saying, so, so you're better than everybody else? I'm not saying we're better than everybody else. I'm just saying that if God literally walks in the room, raises his hand and says, this is me, I'm willing to bet that that's God. And that's what Jesus did. It's almost like, I know it gets a little bit confusing in our church right now because we have three, count them, three Pastor Matts, right? There's Ridgewood Matt, Hoboken Matt, and starting next week officially, Mawa Matt. That's confusing, right? You say, well, who's the pastor of Bethlehem? And three guys go, well, I'm a pastor. You say, yeah, but who's the senior pastor? And I raise my hand, I go, well, well that's me. I'm Pastor Matt. And somebody looks and says, no, you're not Pastor Matt. I think that guy's Pastor Matt. Well, his name's Bob. So I don't think he's Pastor Matt. He goes, but I want him to be Pastor Matt. That's great. Guess what? At the end of the day, he's not. Catch me in the right meeting, I might let him be Pastor Matt for a moment, but he's not going to be. In fact, if I came here for the first time, and you looked and you said, guess what? We just called this guy named Pastor Matt. I'm like, that's crazy. That's me. And you said, no, we're waiting for another guy. I said, you're going to be waiting quite a while, because I'm in the room. I'm the only me that I am. See, a lot of times we do the same thing with God. We say, Jesus, you're not God. Jesus is like, well, last time I checked, yes, I am. Proved it by dying and rising from the dead to save your sins, by the way. And then other people go, no, I don't want you to be God. I want, I want this guy over here to be God. And Jesus is like, well, that's great, but guess what? He's not God. See, in order to grow in our faith in God, we have to recognize who God is. 
And we have to realize that when Jesus says, I'm God, He means it, I'm God. But when you put those two things together, you begin to create environments in which people are more likely to grow in their faith. And then there's one more missing ingredient that we need. Does anybody know what that missing ingredient is? Community. The most important thing we can do as church is to realize that church is not about an individual, but church is about the community that gathers together. And that's what really helps us grow in our faith, is gathering together with other people who are seeking to grow in their faith. Other people who are living a life that believes and confesses in Christ, or who are trying to figure out who Jesus is to begin with. And those people gather together. God says, I'm in the room. I'm here with you, helping you grow in your faith. See, this is really difficult for us as Americans because we're a very individualistic culture, aren't we? And it's really difficult for us in the 21st century because of these things. Technology. Technology is a beautiful thing, but it has not helped us with our problem of individualism, has it? It, it, It's kind of allowed us to be even more individualistic. To, to really hone in on our desires and what we want. That's why you can create personalized playlists on your phone. You, can, you could listen to any teacher you want to around the country through this device right here. In fact, technically, right now, because we're live streaming, you could go to church by yourself in your room and experience the same worship service. How's it going, everybody that's live streaming right now? And that's not a bad thing. But if it becomes the only thing, we miss one of those big pieces that allows the church to help us grow. The community. You know, if it, if it was just about what we could do on our own, then guess what, everybody? I would pre-record this message and we would all sleep in on Sunday and then go to brunch. And some of you are thinking, ah, oh, that's not great. That's a pastor's dream because he never gets to go to brunch best thing in the world added brunch on Saturday because now I can go to brunch. It's an amazing experience. But you know what? It it can help you grow in your faith. And in fact, we're going to use this a lot to begin to grow in our faith. But if we forget to gather together in community, we miss one of the biggest pieces of being able to grow in our faith. And the reason for that is Jesus' number one command to his people is this. Love one another. Love one another as I have loved you. You can't one another by yourself. It's impossible. And the more you grow in your faith, the more you want to grow in your faith, the more you will grow when you serve and love one another. That's why we gather together in community. Mutual support, connection, and the opportunity to serve others as we have been served. So, that's what the Bible says about growing in our faith. Now, the big question becomes, how do we do that here at Bethlehem? You know, a lot of times in the past, you know, we've had lots of different ways in which we grow in our faith. And here's the issue. When you have 50 different things to do in a culture that is already overscheduled, and we live in a culture where everybody lives at the margin, or sometimes I would argue beyond the margin. That's why I always make the joke, if we had a third end of the candle, we would burn that too. That's just the way we are. And it's accentuated in the 21st century because we have these phones that can allow us to be on 24-7. And that's something that happens around the country, but it gets really accentuated here in a culture where we've kind of always been living that way, and now we're able to take it to the next level. So what I've realized is when we step into church, and all of a sudden we say, we have 50 different options for you to do. Here's automatically one of two things people are going to do. Either number one, people are going to try and do everything you can do at church. Why? Because they want to grow in their faith and they know if they spend time in church and they do things at church, these are things that are supposed to help me grow in my faith. So we will continue to perpetuate the problem of overscheduling if we do that. Or two, people will walk into this place and go, there's 50 things to do. I can barely do one more thing. I think I'm going to opt out of this. 
I think connecting with God's just a little bit too difficult. So what we're going to do here at Bethlehem is we're going to simplify the process to connect and to grow in your faith here. I am going to take all the opportunities we have and we're going to narrow them down to just three. Three things that if you do any one of these three or all of these three, you will put yourself in an environment that is connected to Jesus, Christ-centered, gospel-centered, and saturated in community, which means it's an environment you're most likely to grow in your faith. And that's all I want you to focus on. Three things. The first is this, worship. Worship and gathering together in worship is so important, you guys. And do you know why that is? It's because when we gather together, we hear the gospel. We're reminded of who we are in Christ. You know, I made the joke earlier in the time of confession. You're not going to walk into Starbucks, order your coffee, and the barista's going to go, by the way, do you know that you're loved and forgiven by Jesus? We have people that work at churches that work at a Starbucks, and still, I've never had them say, here is your large mocha, and do you know you're loved by Jesus? It's not going to happen. Y'all, the church is the place that happens. And when we step in here and worship, the very first thing God does is He fills us with His gifts. The reminder that we're forgiven in the time of confession and absolution. The opportunity to know without a doubt that we're connected to Him through baptism. And the opportunity to regularly experience the refreshment of faith you find in communion. To be filled with the love and the forgiveness of God. To get to have a group of people that will pray for you in good times and bad times. And to get the opportunity each and every week to open up the Bible and say, okay God, what are you saying? And how can this radically affect my life this week? That's the opportunity you get when you gather together for worship. And what I love about worship at Bethlehem is this is an incredible community to connect with. You know, I, as a pastor, whenever you talk to people from other churches, you always hear people say, my church is the most welcoming place in the world. And I have walked into churches where all I've thought is, I hate to burst your bubble. But no, you are not. <laughs> How do I know that? You gave me the stink eye when I walked in with three small children. Yeah, I know that's going to be a drain on your worship experience. I apologize. They have to go everywhere with us. You didn't welcome me. And you told me I was sitting in your pew. You know what I experienced here at Bethlehem? I experienced the kind of community that when I get up to do the welcome time, we're having to drag people in. Not because they don't want to worship together, but because they're so excited to connect together. Do you know why we always do a song after our greeting time is because if we try to do anything else, you don't stop greeting. You would just keep greeting till we locked the doors and made you leave for lunch. Like, that's community. That's what's so powerful and important because you know what? I had a mentor that once told me, music will attract, preaching will get people to come back, but community is what makes people stay. Because it's that community that life-on-life -life community that changes people's lives. And you guys, we have that in spades here. I never hesitate to invite somebody out to this church because I know it doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter who they are. They will be welcomed when they walk through these doors. And that, to me, is a picture of the gospel. And that's why worship together is so important. And so this fall, we're going to do something different. We're actually going to worship in two services. We're going to do a 9 o'clock and a 1045. And the reason for that is we're running out of room. So there's a very practical reason. In the fall, we won't fit here anymore unless you're okay with sitting on laps. And the poll tells us no. So we're going to create some more services. But instead of trying to cram a Bible study in the middle of the two, we're just going to leave that time for connection. So you have time and space to be able to connect with each other. To grab a cup of coffee and a donut and to get to catch up with people maybe you haven't seen all week. To get to greet people as they come in for a service and as you leave. And it's not to say those other things aren't important. We're going to talk about that next. But it's to say we want to maximize this great gift that God's given us. The gift of community. 
So what are we going to do about Bible study? We're going to simplify all our Bible studies to one thing, connection groups. And connection groups are opportunities for you to gather together in a smaller group of people to be able to open up the Word of God and to study Scripture together. And so those are going to be smaller groups, anywhere from 5 to 25 people. You gather together, and we're going to have connection groups on Sunday and throughout the week. And the way you find out about your connection groups, I told you you use this, is you simply open up your Bethlehem Church mobile app. And if you open up this mobile app and you click on connect, you're literally going to find ways to connect. So you'll be able to do Kids Church, which is a connection group for kids that's going to happen during both services. And if you want to sign up for that, you could sign up for it right now. You're able to do adult groups, youth groups. Youth group will be during the 1045 service. And you guys will have your own coffee time, your own worship time, your own chance to connect. But those connection groups are an opportunity to connect with a smaller group of people. And one of the ways we're going to help you guys do that is through something we started called Right Now Media. And Right Now Media is an opportunity to get great Bible study content. It's kind of like Netflix for Bible study. So that you can join together with others in community right here in Bible study. Or you can use those same resources to do a Bible study at your own home. However you want to use that, those opportunities will be open for you. And that's going to happen during both services. And then the final way that you can grow in your faith, and this is the way we forget about the most, is to join a serve team. You know, so often we hear people say, well, I want to grow in my faith, so I need to go to another Bible study. And people are engaged in like four or five Bible studies, and they're like, I don't know why I'm not growing in my faith. I'm in like four or five Bible studies. Are you applying what you've learned? See, a big heart of growing in your faith is stepping out to serve. You know, one of the greatest examples I've seen of this is uh, a guy named Francis Chan, and his daughter was upstairs. And he says, my daughter came down to me one day, and, he, and I said to her, clean your room. So she goes upstairs. Fifteen minutes later, she came down and said, Dad, I memorized what you told me to say. Clean your room. I can even say it in Greek. Is Francis Chan clean your room? Did you actually do what I told you to do or did you just memorize it? See, a really important part of growing in our faith is stepping up to serve. And it doesn't have to be this huge thing. It doesn't mean that, okay, for me to grow in my faith, I have to prepare and deliver a sermon. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you find little ways to serve, to love one another, whether it's through ushering, whether it's through doing something throughout the week, whether it's through serving in our kids' ministry. In fact, the fastest way to grow in your faith is to serve in the kids' ministry. Not even kidding. We need more people to serve there. It's a great opportunity to grow. But if you find places to serve, what you're going to find out is you'll grow more in your faith. And you can find those opportunities right there on the mobile app as well through Connect Faith. And you can find those opportunities right there on the mobile app as well through Connect. Just click on Serve. Y'all, when it comes to growing in your faith, I can't make you grow. You can look at me and say, make me grow, Pastor. And I'll say, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to put you in a spot where you're likely to grow. And then God will grow you. And so what I want you to know here at Bethlehem is if you want to grow in your faith, there are three incredible opportunities for you to do that. Worship together serve together, connect together around Scripture. If you can't do all those things, pick one. Because the more you surround yourself in Christian community, in a community that's centered on Christ and the Gospel, the more you will grow in your faith. And starting on September 17th, those are going to be the three best ways to do that right here at Bethlehem. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much that we would be able to gather together. Lord, I just pray that you would strengthen us. Lord, that you would grow us in who you are. In the love and forgiveness you have for us. And the way in which that can transform our lives in you. I pray, God, that you would just, this fall, allow us to grow in ways we've never grown before. That you would allow us to experience opportunities to connect with one another, Lord, and to see you actively at work in our lives. And I pray this year, God, we would realize we are closer to you than we ever were before. 
It's in your name, Lord Jesus. It's by your strength we pray. Amen. Word before. It's in your name, Lord Jesus. It's by your strength we pray. Amen.